Hi everyone. So now we're going to dive into seismic inversion basics. And so I'm pretty excited to walk you through this topic because it's a method that's really transformed how we interpret our seismic data um, and gives us good information about our reservoirs. So let's start by looking at the big picture of seismic data and how it relates to actually what's in the ground. So you kind of think about it as this, this loop where we start with basic earth properties like the density and the porosity, uh, the velocities, VP and VS. And what they give us is the acoustic properties, the acoustic impedance and the impedance. And from that, we can calculate the seismic data. And so I've kind of talked about that a lot in this course already. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna work this problem in reverse, and we're gonna go from the seismic data backwards to the acoustic properties. And so that's both the forward problem in purple and the inverse problem in orange. And so um, let me kind of start walking you through that. So when we talk about seismic inversion, we wanna think about uh, really what it's telling us. So here's a kind of simple way to envision it, um, where we have our acoustic impedance on the left. Um, so what we're kind of starting at, in a sense, from that we calculate the reflection coefficient, we convolve it with the wavelet, um, and we get all of our individual reflections that we then get our synthetic seismogram from, or our seismic data from. And so this is what I've been building up on the whole course. Um, but now in the inversion, we want to work the other way. So we have our seismic, and from the seismic, we want to go all the way back to the acoustic imp uh, impedance. All right, so this is our forward problem, and now we want to do the inverse problem. And so if we think about it, um, we could take our seismic data, uh, we could uh, remove the wavelet from it and get our reflection coefficients, right? But the one thing we can't get <laughs> yet um, in this, in this situation is we can't get the acoustic impedance, and this has to do with the frequencies that are available to us. And so in the seismic data, we don't have that low frequency trend. So you could see those lower frequencies are missing. And so it's something that we can't recover in order to get the true acoustic impedance. Um, but luckily, we're able to get the low frequency from our well logs. So if we have a general trend of the acoustic impedance from wells that are drilled in our seismic area, we can add that into the seismic and kind of flush out those lower frequencies. So now we can go from the reflection coefficients from the seismic all the way back to the acoustic impedance. And so here's another way to visualize it. Um, we can take that low frequency model, so you can get it from the well logs like I mentioned, but you can also get it from velocity models. Um, we combine that with the seismic data where the wells are tied, that gives us the wavelet um, uh, for in the seismic. So we divide the seismic by the wavelet, and then we end up with the acoustic impedance result. So that's looking at it more, more in a data sense. And so you might be wondering why we go through all of this trouble to do the seismic inversion. And there's a lot of benefits for it. Um, some of the key ones are that first it converts our seismic from that uh, uh, to boundary information to more of the layer information. And this is really good because it makes our data look more like actual geology, um, which is really, really helpful when you're working with non-geologists or non-geoscientists who aren't used to thinking about things in terms of interfaces. <laughs> um, second, it effectively removes those pesky wavelet effects, so the side lobes and the tuning effects that we've talked about in this class um, that kind of trick us into seeing things that aren't really there. And then another reason it's really good is that it helps us estimate the thickness for layers that are near or around the tuning thickness, so we can be a little bit more quantitative in terms of our reservoir prediction. Um, and then the output we get from it is usually some sort of impedance, whether it's acoustic or elastic. And so one of the things we want to keep in mind is that inversions are not unique. And so what I mean by that is that an unconstrained inversion can generate a whole bunch of different impedance models from the same seismic data. Um, and so that's why we want to be able to take the low frequency trend um, and, and include it in the inversion as part of the process. Uh, uh, the other thing we want to keep in mind with seismic is that different rocks can have similar impedance contrasts. So again, when we're doing the acoustic impedance inversion, um, we can't necessarily understand exactly what our rocks are. We're still looking at 
the relative or the absolute acoustic impedance and not necessarily this is a sand and this is a shale. But we can do that when we have the well log information. So there's different types of inversion that are available to us. Um, and so you can think about these as all the different tools that you have in your toolbox. And you can choose the type of inversion that matches the goals of your seismic investigation. Um, so starting really simple at the top of this list, we have the acoustic impedance inversion. And this uses single or near offset data. Um, and then as we move up, or I guess down my list in complexity, there's the elastic impedance inversion, which works with uh, angle stacks. And then we have the simultaneous inversion, which can handle multiple angle stacks at once or gathers. Um, and then we have a stochiastic inversion, which brings in a lot more geostatistics. And so as you can guess, <laughs> kind of working down this list, we're trading increased complexity um, for you know, time and the cost of, of doing all this extra, um, including more information for potentially better results and better understanding of our reservoir. Um, so you want to choose the inversion that's right for your investigation and for your project. And so I'm going to show you a really quick example, just a couple of slides, or a couple of examples, I guess, <laughs> of post-stack inversion results. And so there's a lot of information um, about seismic conversion out there, and I'm always happy to, to point you to more data. Um, there's some great textbooks that cover this. Again, this is one of those topics that I'm trying to cover in 10 minutes, but which should in its own right and has been, um, you know, an entire semester class that I've taught. <laughs> so, um, okay, so let's let's go through some, some examples. And so when I talk about the post-stack conversion, it's giving us information about the acoustic impedance. And so the acoustic impedance, I've talked a lot about in this class, um, but when we're talking about it in terms of an inversion, we want to remind ourselves that what we're getting is information about the velocity and the density. So uh, the bulk velocity, the bulk density. So what's in the fluid uh, pores, or <laughs> the fluid filled pore space, as well as the matrix. Um, and so both of those features we can be very, very interested in, in terms of reservoir characterization. And so, when we think about why we would do this inversion, um, looking at the difference between amplitude interpretation and acoustic impedance, we can see that on the amplitude side, we're looking at layer contrast, which I've mentioned before, can be a little bit tricky. We've got often noisy data. You know, we, we may be able to tie it to our wells in terms of interfaces, but with the acoustic impedance, we're getting those actual layer properties that make more sense, you know, kind of like, uh, looking at an outcrop, <laughs> where instead of just seeing the interface between the limestone and the sandstone, we're seeing the limestone itself. And so we can direct compare it a little bit more directly to well data. Um, the other thing about acoustic impedance is we're removing some of the effects of the wavelet, so it can handle noise better, and it's just overall better for visualizing uh, geologic bodies, and we can use it for geobody interpretation, geobody visualization and interpretation in, in the software packages. And so we can look at this classical example of how an acoustic impedance inversion is helpful using our, our friend, the wedge model. <laughs> and so this demonstration is kind of really powerful because it shows us how inversion helps um, us go from one of our biggest challenges, which is often resolving those thin beds. So remember, we've got those thinner beds in the wedge uh, where we get the effects of tuning. And so the inversion results let us not only see the boundaries of the edge more clearly, but we can also look and see what's happening inside of the wedge in terms of actual rock properties, which is something that we can't really see when we look at the synthetic or the seismic itself, um, the more conventional data. And so here's another example, a more real world <laughs> example, uh, that really demonstrates the power of inversion. And so when we look at amplitude data alone on the left-hand side, uh, we can see that all three of these wells um, have very similar acoustic impedance, uh, very similar amplitude responses. And we've got two gas wells and one water well. And so really we want to, you know, have a seismic volume or some sort of seismic product that can differentiate between the wet wells and the gas bearing wells. And so when we do the acoustic impedance inversion, uh, we notice over here on the right side, that the water well actually has a much um, higher acoustic impedance than the gas wells do. So they're kind of more yellow in color versus on the edge of the, the blue and red. Um, and so this is a, a great 
kind of demonstration of how we can get a product from the seismic data by taking the seismic and the well logs together and better discriminate where we may have wet reservoirs versus hydrocarbon bearing reservoirs. Another thing we can do um, that is super practical if we have well logs with uh, porosity information um, is we can calculate the acoustic impedance from the well logs and we could do that on a cross plot. So you see we have a trend between porosity and acoustic impedance, so a bit of a negative trend. And what we can do is we can take this trend line, okay? We could take this trend line and if we have this well in a seismic volume where we have the acoustic impedance calculated from our post stack inversion, we can now ap apply this trend line to the seismic data in the area around this well to get a pseudo porosity volume from our seismic data. Um, and that's just like one kind of a quick example of, of how we can use those inversion results. And so I want to wrap up with a couple of key takeaways. Um, so first off, uh, with seismic inversion, we want to try to integrate the seismic data, the well control, um, that we want to use the best estimations we have from, of the, the source, uh, kind of the wave seismic wavelet, um, and all of that together. And so what acoustic impedance allows us to do, or the inversion allows us to do, is deconvolve the wavelet from the seismic data to get that acoustic impedance model. Um, and you know, the other thing we want to think about is that acoustic impedance often has a very close relationship with porosity. And so some sort of porosity volume, like I just demonstrated, is something that we can also calculate with, uh, with inversion. So thanks for listening.